Perfect. Okay, so let's get started. So from last week and since also last lecture, we started to talk about data modeling, right? So, and that's a, yeah, we already started. Yeah, so we start to talk about data modeling, right? And that's a process that you take as simple the application that you want to build and first to model it conceptually, right? The language that we have been using to really model it conceptually is by drawing a entity relationship diagram that looks like this. You have all those rectangles corresponding to entity sites and then you have this diamond shaped thing corresponding to relationships. You try to encode all the entities that you have in your application and also their relationships, their attributes. The goal of this step is to make sure you can actually tell the machine precisely all the data and the constraints that you have in this application. After that, the second step is what we call logical modeling. And that's a step that we take as input this conceptual model and translate that into a concrete logical data representation. You can take different type of data models, right? In this course, we will be focused on relational model that we think about data as a collection of relations. And we talk about how to define a relational schema, right? So this is just one of these examples. On Wednesday, on last lecture, we talk about how to do this translation, right? So we have the entity side in the conceptual model become relations, and we have relationships in the conceptual model become also relations. And we talk about how can we pick keys to really enforce some of the kinetic constraints, and we talk about uh, how to merge those relations, when to merge, and uh, like when should we merge, and uh, when should we not merge. So today we are going to continue to talk about this process. If you think about what conceptual model is, what entity relationship diagram is, it's actually a language for you to specify constraints. And this diagram looks, I mean, may, may look a little bit weird, like a vague or something like that, but it's actually defined a very precise collection of constraints you have on your data. So what do you mean by that? Right? So let's look at this diagram. You have three different entity sites, A, B, and C, and you have one relationship, R. And you have two kinetic constraints. Right? You have one corresponding to C, meaning that if you, I know A and B, I know C, right? I have the one corresponding to B, meaning that if I know A and C, I know B. If you look at this diagram, what you are telling the rest of the world is essentially these three different logical sentences. The first one, is the relationship R happens among entity sites A, B, and C. What does it even mean? Right? It means that as long as I have three different things, A, B, C, participate in this relationship, it implies that I know the type. I know A is of entity site A, right? B is of entity site B, so on and so forth. This is a precise representation about what do we mean by there is a relationship between these three different entity sites. And there's another logical formula that we tell the rest of the world by drawing this diagram. And something looks like this, right? So this corresponding to one of the cardinality. Essentially, this one says, okay, if you give me A, B, C, right? So there's two concrete part uh, entity participate in this relationship. If I draw this diagram, that implies you cannot find another tuple, A, B, C prime, in this relationship R that C prime is not equal to C, right? Which means that if I have this diagram, right, the unique combination of A and B can only appear once in this relationship. This is what we mean by one of these cardinality constraints. And we have another one, right? So we say, yeah, so we cannot, like for every single unique combination of A and C, right, it can only appear once in this relationship. So ER diagram, the conceptual modeling part, is all about defining constraints, defining the information we have in the, in the, in the database, and define the collection of valid 
database instances. So it's all about constraints. And when we do the translation, right, take as simple this conceptual model and translate that into a relation schema, we also think about the constraints, right? So uh, we translate every single entity side into relations, and we translate the relationship R into another relation. And we think about how to define the primary key for this relationship R, right? So we spent a whole bunch of effort last time talk about how to do that. So there are multiple ways to do it, right? So in this case, you could say, yeah, and because there's a kinetic constraint between these three different entity sites, if I'm thinking about the primary key of this relationship, uh, of, of this relation R, it cannot be the whole site, right? Because that's not the minimal subset of uh, attributes that are going to define, like, like, like that uniquely identify tuples. It need to be either A and C, I could use that as a primary key, um, or I can do A and B, right? So in this case, assuming we say, yeah, in the translation, let's specify A and C as a primary key. So last time, there's a very good question, is once you do that, essentially what we are trying to do is actually try to enforce the last constraint by using a primary key, right? So what do you mean by primary key? By primary key means that if I know the value of A and C, I can uniquely identify a tuple. You cannot find two tuples share the same value of A and C, but have a different B value, which is essentially the last constraint that you have. So you are able to enforce some constraints by just defining the original schema. Right? Some of the constraints are enforced by primary key. But that's also left for uh, some other question, that's what should we do with these two constraints? Right? So I mean, there are multiple things you can do. You can just ignore them, for example. Right? But on the other hand, if it is really important for you to encode these two constraints, we need to define some new concept within the new tool for to specify all those constraints in a more flexible way, just going beyond simply enforcing them by defining a primary key. And that is what we are going to talk about today, by introducing the notion of integrity constraint and also talk about how to implement those constraints inside the SQL database. So today we are going to talk about constraints in database. If you think about what the constraints are, they are actually try to give you conditions that a valid database instance need to satisfy. And we already see actually many ways for you to define constraints about the data to put into your database, right? So we talk about the key constraints, which precisely give you a condition that looks like this. It tells you a very concrete logical statement that all the database instances need to satisfy if it is a valid database instance under this schema. So there are constraints. And we also have type constraint, right? Whenever we are defining a relation, we actually write down the type of each attribute. If I say, yeah, so this is an integer, right? So, and, and first column of this, uh, this relation is an, uh, is an integer, you cannot put a string into it, right? So it gave you some really strong constraint about what is a valid database instance and what is not a valid database instance. And we also, essentially, inherently, we define the shape, right? So whenever you write down a relational schema, right, you actually know, okay, so this relation contains, for example, a, a, a triple, right? It, it's a, it, it, it can only have a tuple of three different elements, right? Once you define that, you cannot put uh, a tuple with four elements into that relation, right? The schema also gives you the shape. So you have a whole bunch of these things already to help you to define constraints to actually spe specify what are valid database instance, what are not. So, but can we do better? Can we define more constraints? Can we have a more flexible way of telling the system what is a valid database instance and what is not a valid database instance? And to do this in a SQL database, you need something called integrity constraint. And uh, to make sure 
that whenever you are loading data into your database or whenever you are changing data or manipulating data in your database, uh, it's going to satisfy all the constraints and do not cause trouble later on. So that's the goal. Okay. So here's just some example, right? So we have key, right? So what type of constraint we want to enforce? We want to enforce key constraint, uh, actually different key constraints because there could be different kinds of keys. We want to enforce continuity, attribute domain, subset relationship for generalization, right? For example, uh, if you have a person on the side, you have a professor on the side, after translation, become person and professor, you say, yeah, I mean, I cannot have a professor uh, who are not person, for example, right? So every single professor ID in the professor table also need to appear in the person table, for example. That's another type of constraint, right? So there's referential integrity, right? So assuming you have uh, a relation called a course, a relation called a professor, or a relation called a teaches, right? Professor teach course, right? You want to make sure whatever tuple I put into the teaches re relation, right? professor teach course, need to appear in the professor table, right? So that professor ID teaching this course need to be a real professor, right? So you have all those type of constraints, and we are going to talk about how to enforce all of this inside the database system, and that's by defining integrity constraint. So let's look at the simplest case. One type of constraint that you can enforce in your database is to say, okay, I have this table. I know all the values you put into this attribute cannot be null. It need to be concrete values, okay? You cannot say I don't know in this attribute. So this is one type of constraint that you can define. So essentially certain attributes cannot be null. So the way to do it is when you define this schema, you specify that. For example, if I say, yeah, so here's a student relation that has three different attributes. I have student ID, right, with the type integer. I have student name with the type is a string, right? And then I have, for example, GPA, right, which is a floating point real number. And I say, in this database, I cannot have a student uh, without a GPA. That's a constraint, right? If you give me a database where you say, yeah, for this student, I don't know the GPA, that's not a valid database instance for this application. So the way to do that is to have this keyword, not now, just follow the attributes when you define the schema. Once you have this, the system actually knows about what you're talking about. Yeah, so whatever data you have, when you insert them into the table, or when you manipulate them, when you update it, right? So you cannot have the case that you have a GPA that's, that's null. So now let's look at this. So this is the simplest case of, of, the, of the constraint. So let's do some simulation, right, in our mind about this constraint. In the beginning, assume I have empty relation and uh, I run this query. Okay, I insert into this relation a tuple with student ID equals to one, student name is B, GPA is 3.2. So the game that we are going to play is to think about once I run this SQL query, will the database throw an error or not, okay? So in this case, clearly it should be fun, right? So it's going to check the constraint. It's going to check actually many constraints. First one, it's going to check whether the type constraint is satisfied. Right? And to say, yeah, the first one should be an integer, the second one is string, the third one is a real number. Okay? It also needs to check, essentially, uh, whether you are inserting a, a triple or not. I, I, I need to have three elements here, right? I mean, I'm here, it, here is fun. So it also needs to check whether this not null constraint is being satisfied or not. Right? In this case, it's fun, right? You are inserting a concrete number, 3.2, right? Which is not null, the database will be happy about it. So as you can see, even you are defining a very simple constraint, and whenever you are inserting data into the database, it's actually checking quite a lot of things for you automatically, right? And then as a user, you do not have to think about that, and that's the power of relational database that we are talking about. Okay, so assume you run this, right? Now you have a database uh, relation with one tuple, right, in it. You run another one, okay? So now you insert, okay, the student ID equals no, uh, student name is a concrete string, GPA is 3.4. Will the database be okay with that? 
who's in the database will not throw an error? Who's in the database will throw an error? Okay, so in this case, it's going to be, uh, going to be fun, right? Because all the concern that you have is the GPA attribute uh, is not null. In this case, the GPA equals 3.4, which is not null, database will be, will be okay with it. So far, so good? Do you agree on this? Who agree? Who agree? Okay, perfect. Now let's continue, right? So I insert another tuple. I did, uh, I did three, the name is F, and the uh, GPA is null. In this case, I think we can all agree it's going to throw an error for you because now you are inserting a value which is null into an attribute that you say is not null, right? Okay? So once you run this, right, what do you have in your database? You have a relation with two tuples, okay? Because the third tuple will not be inserted, right? Now you have a relation with only two tuples, the first two tuples are inserted. And then what, we, what if you run this, this query? Let's read that together, okay? Now I have two tuples in this relation, and then I run another SQL query, which is update this relation, update student, you set GPA equals to null, where SID equals to what? What would we have? Before you run this query, you already have two tuples, one with student ID one, another with student ID equals to null, right? So the consequence of running this query is you are going to turn the GPA of the first tuple that we just inserted from 3.2 to null, right? So that new tuple is going to violate this constraint, so this one will actually throw an error if you run this. Make sense? Any questions? Okay. So what about this one? So before you run this, right, so third and fourth query going to throw an error, so database will not make any changes if you run the third and the fourth query. It's just going to throw an error for you. So before you run the last query, all you have in the database uh, essentially the first two tuples. Now you say, okay, I want to update this relation. I want to set GPU equal to null, where I set equal to 10. Okay. What would the database do if you run this? Who thinks the database will throw an error? Who thinks the database will not throw an error? Okay, so in this case, the database will not throw an error. If you look at why, is before I run this, I have two tuples. The first one with student ID equals to one. The second one with student ID uh, that is null, okay? And then we will run this. N there's no tuple going to satisfy the where condition of this query. Essentially, this query will not change any of the GPA value of, of any of the tuples, okay? So when that happens, essentially you are not making any changes. So although there could exist a database instance such that running this query will cause an error, but it is not this database instance, okay? So when database run this, it's going to give you, it's going to reason about the actual concrete change that you are making on this uh, database instance. It's not trying to reason whether there exists a database instance such that run this query could cause an error, okay? So it's going to compute the extra change, and then it's going to reason whether those extra changes are going to violate this constraint. So in this case, you are changing nothing by running this query, so you are violating nothing, okay? Okay, so this is a very simple type of constraint. It's going to get more trickier after this. So second type of constraint that you can actually specify uh, is by specifying the primary key, okay? And we have been through this actually many times. So essentially, uh, certain attributes, or certain collection of attributes, uh, is a primary key means that it need to be unique, okay, in the relation, and also it cannot be null. So whenever you have the primary key constraint, that's what you mean. It's unique and not null. So the way to do that is you say, yeah, so assuming I want to say student ID is a primary key, I just have this keyword following the name of the attributes. So once you have this, essentially you say, yeah, whatever value put into this relation, that attributes need to be unique. I cannot find another tuple in this relation sharing the same thing. And second, I need, it, it, it cannot be null. Okay, so this is 
what, what do we mean by primary key? So now let's do some simulation, right? Again, let's do this case. Assuming I have a tuple inserted with I set equals to one, right? Something like this. Well, the database should be fun, right? So just check the type is fun. It check, uh, it check whether it's kind of a triple, right? It's fun. It check whether the primary key that you inserted, which is one, whether it's null. Here's not null, it's fun. Second, whether it's unique. Now I have an empty relation, there's nothing there. When I inserted, uh, when, when, when I inserted this tuple, so it's still going to be unique, okay? So this is going to be fun about that. And second thing is, okay, now let's insert another tuple where SID, uh, where SID equals to null, okay? Uh, in this case, of course, database is going to say, yeah, so you cannot do that. This attribute is the primary key. I'm not allowing you to have any tuple with a null value, okay? Make sense? Then we're going to throw an error here. And then in this case, if you do the third one, right, so it's going to be fun, right? So now the SSD is, uh, is three, right? It's not null, it's unique. So database is going to run it for you. Now I have two tuples in this relation. And what if we run this query? No. I insert another tuple with ID equals to one. Who think we will throw an error? Who think we will not throw an error? Okay, yeah, if it's an error, right? It's not unique, right? The value is a primary key constraint. And what if we do this? So I update this relation. I set ID equals to one where GPA is null. Okay? Who thinks this one will throw an error? Who thinks this one will not? Okay. So in this case, I have two tuples in this relation, right? One tuple has GP equal null, right? I'm going to flip in the ID of that one from three to one because I already have a tuple in the database with ID equals to one, so this one going to violate the constraint. Okay, make sense? Okay. This looks simple, but uh, let's look at the tricky case. So what if instead of doing the last one, we do that query? So now I have two tuples in my relation. Uh, the first one is ID equals to one. The second one is ID equals to three. Now I say, okay, I want to update this, this relation setting ID equals to ID minus two. What would we get in this case? Who think it will throw an error? Who think it will not throw an error? Okay. <laughs> so this is actually a really tricky case. Uh, and in practice, you cannot need to be careful. This is actually one case that assumption that relation is a set of bags that the order doesn't matter start to break between theory and the practice. Okay? So let's try to see the behavior. Okay? So we have... Yeah, I think too many people are clicking this. Um, okay, so in this case, uh, sorry, I need to. Let's see why does it work? Nope. Okay. Yeah, so we'll go back home. Uh, try to click the same link. It should work. I think right now there are too many people clicking that. Probably, yeah. Um, okay, so in this, this is a tricky case, okay? So when we talk about relation, we always say, yeah, it's a site, the order doesn't matter, user shouldn't know. But what the database actually try to do here is actually, it try to go through every single tuple in this relation, and then it's going to update it one by one, okay? It's going to decrease the ID of the first tuple by two, it's, and, then, and then it's going to check the constraint, tuple by tuple, okay? So it's going to change the first tuple, check the constraint, change the second tuple, check the constraint. Even though as a user, you do not supposed to know how the, how the tuples are being stored in this relation, the database needs to store them in some order, right? 
and that's a problem. Depending on your data order in your relation, you are going to have different behavior. If your first tuple have ID equals to one, the second tuple have ID equals three, this one is going to be fun because when updated, after the first tuple, I have minus one and three. It's fun. And then I do the second tuple, I have minus one and one, which is also fun, right? So if your data order is in that case, it's, it's going to run that for you. If your data order happened to be on your hard drive, to be that your ID equals to three is first, and ID equals to one is the second, this one will throw an error, okay? Because it's going to update the first tuple, turn the three into one, and then that's going to validate the constraint because one is not unique. I have another tuple with ID equals to one. Okay, so this is one of the tricky cases. That even for primary key, right, there could be some tricky behavior from most of the database system that you see today. So there are ways to accommodate that, but if you are doing nothing inside of PostgreSQL, if you run this query, you may get a different behavior, okay? And in this case, in this very specific case, it, it is often the case that, I mean, it's not, it's not guaranteed, but often when you insert tuple into the database, it's going to insert for you one by one. It, there's no guarantee that database is going to do that, but it is often, uh, but you'll be very surprised if that doesn't happen, okay? So in this case, you insert one first and insert three. If you run this query, highly likely in your database, physically, the tuple one is stored before tuple three, and if you run this, it should be fun in most of the cases, okay? But you can construct a case where this one is going to throw an error for you. It is when the tuple three is being stored before tuple one physically, okay? Make sense? Any question about this? Yeah, so um, that's something that you can cite uh, in database. It's actually when that's a checking happen. So by default, it's going to check one by one if you do nothing. But you are able to cite, for example, you can wrap this up as a, uh, as we are going to see after Easter, uh, wrap this up as a transaction. And you'll say only check the constraint after the whole transaction finish. So you are able to do that, yeah. But if you run this directly inside PostgreSQL, you could see some weird behavior. Okay, by default, the checking happens after you change every single tuple, but that is something that you are able to change. Okay? Any questions? Okay, great. So as you can see, even the, the interior constraint looks very simple, there are those tricky cases, okay? So we have this primary key constraint, so how can we encode uh, a key constraint, right? Um, so there are more. Right? So for primary key, you can also specify that, not for a single attribute, but for a collection of attributes, right? So in this case, what should we do, right? Um, in this case, you can actually, instead of having this primary key following uh, each of the attribute, you can have the whole thing here. You can define the schema, it has three different attributes, and then I have the primary key, which is a combination of the first attribute and the second attribute. If you have this, what you are actually defining is to say, okay, the combination of these two attributes uh, need to be uh, unique and cannot be null, okay? And you can only define one of these primary key for, uh, for relation, okay? There's only one primary key per relation. So the tricky thing here is we need to think about what do we mean uh, by the combination is not null, okay? When I have this, the primary key is student ID and name. Can I insert something where student ID is not null but name is null, right? In this case, in this case it's not fun. Like, like all the attributes in the primary key cannot be null. So that, that, that would be mean by this combination cannot be null. So now let's look at some example. Okay, now I have this. I insert a tuple that uh, looks like this, okay? 
insert into student, you have value, one, now, and two. Your name is now, your ID is one. In this case, the database will not be happy about it because my primary key is this combination. Both of those attributes uh, cannot be null. Okay? And then if you do this one, you have ID is one, name is, oh, sorry, ID is two, name is two, right? So this one is going to be, going to be fun, okay? And then if you do this, ID equals two, name equals to three, what would, the, uh, what would the database do in this case? I already have a two two in the, in the, in the table. Now I have insert another tuple two and three. Who thinks it's going to throw an error? Who thinks it will not throw an error? Okay, so this one will not throw an error because when we check the uniqueness of the primary key, we are checking the combination, right? So we have a combination with two and two. Now we have two and three. These are different values, okay, in terms of the primary key uniqueness. And then if you insert another one with two and two, right, I think we can all agree that this is going through an error because that, that's not unique anymore, okay? A primary key is defined over a subset of attributes. It need to be unique in the sense of the combination. It need to be not null, okay? So this uh, uh, about key constraint. So you can only have one primary key for each relation. What if I have another type of uniqueness constraint in my relation? So to do that, you can also define a whole bunch of unique constraints, okay? You can only have one primary key, but you can define multiple unique constraints in your schema. So it simply means all the attributes need to be unique, okay? If you want the subset of attribute to be unique and not now, right, you can just keep defining those, right? So you, are, you can only define one primary key per relation, but you can define all those candidate keys with uniqueness constraint and with not null constraint. So the way to do that is actually pretty simple, right? So you can do this. You can just have this unique keyword following each of the attributes. You can also define a unique keyword similar to the primary key over a subset of attributes, okay? So once you do this, uh, so the only tricky thing is once you define the unique constraint, uh, the value could be null. Right. Okay, primary key is unique and not null. Okay, when you define the unique constraint, it's only define the unique constraint as the name implied. It has nothing to do with whether this value can be null or not. Essentially, when you define a unique constraint here, that attribute is able to be null. Okay, so let's look at that behavior together. If you have uh, this case, I have a SID equals is primary key, as name is unique. I insert into this relation with SID equals null and the uh, name equals to one. So this one is not be fun because my primary key got violated, okay? If I insert this one, I insert ID equals one, name is null. It should be fun, right? Because the primary key constraint is fun. Uh, if I look at S name, it's null but uh, my unique constraint tell me nothing about whether this can be null or not, so database should be fine, okay? Now what if I do this again? Now I have a database with one relation, uh, sorry, with, with one tuple, ID is one, name is null. I insert another one, ID is two, so the primary key is fine, but uh, the name is also null. What should the database do? And now value is unique. Who thinks the database will throw an error for you? Who thinks the database will not throw an error for you? Yeah. So in this case, what the database is going to do is really try to compare these two values and reject it when they are equal. Okay, so that's underlying semantic. If you compare two null values, they are actually not equal because they they are not a value, they are a state. They are states that you tell database, I have no idea what that value is, okay? If you compare these two, uh, it's going to tell you, I don't know. Uh, and that is a case that you are not violating the uniqueness constraint, okay? No values are fun, right? In this case, database will be okay with that. It's allow you to insert multiple no values into a unique attribute, okay? So what if you do, you do this? You have another one, right? 
So this, uh, with ID is three, name is one, this one's fun, right? It's unique. And what if you do this one? You insert another tuple where ID is four, your name is one, right? In this case, uh, it goes through an error because the uniqueness uh, of S, S name is violated. I already have a tuple where the name is one. Ah, okay, okay. No, no, the first query, uh, you are not able to run it because it violates the, the primary key constraint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sense? Okay, great. So it's very simple, okay, but, 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 uh, but uh, we'll go back home, do this exercise that, assuming you are a database system, do the simulation, right? Once you agree with all of this, you should be fine, okay? But it's very important for you to do that at least once, okay? So there's some corner cases. That are, that are kind of tricky. So you can define multiple attributes to be unique. Okay? So combination can be unique. So the way to do it, right, you can say, yeah, so I have this whole bunch of unique constraints. I say in this relation, right, the combination of SID and, na uh, and S name need to be unique, and also the combination of SID and GPA need to be unique. Right? So in this case, uh, the only tricky thing is if you talk about null, right, so uh, again, like, uh, like uh, those columns can have multiple those null values, which is fun. Uh, just look at one example, right? If you have this, like two unique constraints over two subset of attributes, if you insert into this with three different null values, right, database is going to be fun, right? And you can insert another one, it's going to be fun, and going to be fun. Okay, make sense? Uniqueness has nothing to do with null. Null are different with each other. So that's the only thing you need to remember. So it's not, it's not that hard to understand because under the cover, the database needs to check uniqueness. The way to check uniqueness is to take two values and to see whether A equals to B returns to true. Okay? So that is why two null values are unique in this semantic. Okay? There's no magic behind it. <coughs> and you can do more. You can check you have more flexible thing uh, to check about constraints. Uh, so there's something called a check, okay, inside database. So essentially you can actually define a local checking condition over attributes. So it's local in the sense whenever I'm checking this constraint, my assumption is I have one tuple, okay? And then I write a formula to say, uh, if that formula is true over this tuple, I'm fine. Okay, so it's local. It can only take one tuple. It cannot take multiple tuples. So this is just one example, okay? So now I have this student relation with, for example, four attributes, ID, name, GPA, and semester, and I say, okay, so now my constraint needs to be the complex. I need to make sure the GPA of the students is between zero and four, and also need to make sure the semester is bigger than, is, is larger than zero and smaller than 20, for example. So the way to do that is to have this check constraint here, okay? And then you have uh, this condition. You have this GPA smaller or equal than four, those type of things, and all, so that's going to happen, right? So it's very similar how to write the where condition in SQL, but you can actually write that here. So the semantic of this, is as long as this condition does not evaluate to false, okay? So it's going to become clear why I say that, right? So uh, if this is not false, it's going to be okay. It's going to reject your tuple when this thing evaluate to false, okay? So now let's look at one example. If I insert one tuple where ID is one, name is one, GP is 1.2, semester is five, what would the database tell you? In this case, uh, let's look at together. It's fun, right? So in this case, this condition going to evaluate to true, right? And database will say, okay, I mean, it satisfied my constraint, that's good. What if you do this one? Your GP is five, semester is five, 
it's going to violate the first components, but because you are doing an all with the second components, so that condition going to evaluate to true, so you are going to be okay, okay? And then what if you have this one? Your GPA is 1.2, your semester is 20, it's violate the second part by because you are all in the middle, right? So database is going to be okay with that. What if you have this one? So look at this one. You have a GPA is null, and you have your uh, semester is five. And my condition is my GPA is between zero and four, my semester is between zero and 20, for example. Who thinks this one is okay? Okay? Not okay? Okay, so this one is actually a little bit tricky, but the way to think about it is to think about how does that condition evaluate to, okay? Which value? In this one, the first part, first half part, checking on the GPA, is going to give you unknown. Because um, GPA is null, right? So that condition is unknown. I don't know the value of that. The second component is going to give you true, okay? Because you have all in the middle, unknown or true is true. Because it doesn't matter what that unknown value is. It can be true, can be false. Whatever that thing is, you are going to evaluate to true. So essentially you have, no, you have unknown or true is true, and then the condition evaluates to true, so this one's going to be fine. Okay, make sense? Okay. Now let's look at uh, it's not a corner case, but, uh, but essentially one specific design decisions that uh, most of, uh, actually the SQL, SQL standard make when you have this. Because now I have a three value logic system, right? For every single condition, it can evaluate to true, it can evaluate to false, it can evaluate to unknown. So it's relatively easy to, 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 to understand the behavior when the Value is true or false, because when it's true, I'm okay, when it's false, I reject it, I'm not fine. What would happen if it is unknown? So, I cannot think about any fundamental reason why database try to do it, but uh, in SQL standard, what it's going to do is check, it's going to accept unknown and true. It, it, it only rejects things when it's evaluated to false, okay? So it try to do this. So whenever you have unknown on true, uh, it's going to say it's okay. Only when it's false, it's going to reject it. it it's okay. So like this is just one specific decision that SQL standard make about the semantic of check. So in this case, right, if we look at this example, now I have a little bit tricky. Okay, so my condition actually has nothing to do with my tuple value is my condition is null is not null, okay? If I define this schema, what would the database give me? Yeah, let's think about this together. Assume we have this relation, have this very weird condition. Can I even insert tuple into this relation without any error? Who think we are able to insert tuple without error? who think we are not able to insert any tuple. Okay, so I don't have no idea, let's look at it together, okay? So the way to think about it uh, is by thinking about how does this condition, uh, which value of this condition evaluate to, right? In this case, null is not null, is always false. The null is null is true, okay? Null is not null is false. Because this one is always false no matter what you put into your database, what, whatever tuple you have, this one is always false, so essentially it's going to reject all the input that you have. Whatever you put in is going to reject it because check going to reject false, okay? What about this one? Now my condition is I want to check null equals to null. Who think this one going to accept some tuples? Who think this one going to reject all the tuples? Okay, now let's take a break, and then we continue to talk about this after 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, so let's continue. 
Okay, can people on Zoom hear me? Can I get a signal? Oh, okay, great. Okay, so let's continue. So let's look at this example, right? And then try to think about what that will give us. Now our condition is now equals to now, right? So and the way to think about it is always think about how does this condition going to evaluate, okay? So like in this case, what you are going to have uh, is to say, uh, this one going to always be, no, it's not, always going to be unknown, right? If you compare to null value with each other, uh, the answer is not true, not false, but I don't know, I have no idea. I, I don't know whether they're equal or not, right? Because I don't know either of those, right? So how can I know how, whether they're the same or not? So in this case, right, you are going to have unknown. So that become a little bit tricky because I mean, to be honest, no principled reason that uh, whether your database should accept this or not. So this is probably one of the few things you have to remember. Uh, in SQL standard, um, this one will be okay. So check is going to only reject false, okay? True or unknown going to be fine, okay? So uh, and you can think about intuition why is doing that, right? But uh, if you are building a database, do the other way, maybe the user will complain, but there's nothing stop you from doing that, right? So this is probably something that you need to remember, okay? So that's something you can play with. Uh, let's try whether this works or not. Oh, yeah, so it actually works. So um, this is something that you can actually run by yourself. So the whole bunch of those links, like, uh, like uh, uh, on the slides, so when you go back home, you can actually click them and see the behavior of the database. It's very important for you to see. So during the lecture, because so many people are clicking those, and sometimes this website gets crashed, uh, essentially you have one table, right? So you have this condition, now equals to now, right? You have this condition, now is not now. You build a schema, and then we'll insert tuple. Yeah, you can see essentially the behavior we have been talking about uh, is actually true, okay? So the first one is going to be fine. Whatever tuple you insert, this is going to be fun, but the second one is actually going to throw an error for you, okay? And this is what the error is going to look like in PostgreSQL, okay? During the lecture, we always say, yeah, going to throw an error, right? This is what that's going to look like, okay? It's actually violate the check constraint, so it actually have a name, okay? And there is some, some detail, okay? Okay, great. So there are more about check. So uh, one thing that's really important to keep in mind is check only happen at the tuple level, okay? So we are going to illustrate this behavior with one example. So think about this. For some reason, I want a GPA plus semester equals to 10, which is a very bad constraint if you think about it. But uh, assuming that's true, okay? GPA and semester, the sum equals 10. Assuming I run this query, Right, GPA is five, semester is five, so I'm going to be fine, okay? Now I have one tuple in the database. What if we run this one? GPA is equal, uh, equal to GPA minus one. This is a simple case, right? Who thinks this one will throw an error? Will not throw an error? This one will throw an error, right? Because my constraint is GPA plus semester equals 10, uh, I have five and five, I decrease the first one by, by one, I have four and five equals to nine, so it's not fun, okay? But look at this one. This one gets a little bit trickier. Now I have this constraint that is two values sum together equals to 10. Now I have another update query saying that I want to decrease GPA by one and I want to increase semester by one. So what would we get? Who think it will throw an error? It will not throw an error? Okay. So the disagreement we have between these uh, two groups of people is when does the check happen, right? When you have updates, when you are updating multiple things, when should we do the check? So in this case, the check will happen at the tuple level. This is actually what we mean. Check happens at tuple level. Essentially, once I finish my updates of the whole tuple, then I check. 
Okay, even though I have I could have multiple updates in the middle, I, I change my GPA, I change my semester, I will not check in the middle. I will check after your update of the whole tuple is finished. Okay, so in this case, <coughs> even though within the execution, I could have some intermediate state that violate this check constraint, but uh, database is going to be fun. All it's going to do is going to allow you to update the, the tuple at once, and then say, okay, now I check. In this case, once you finish updating this tuple, your GPA will become four, your semester become six, it's going to satisfy your constraint, okay? So there's always granularity of checking integrity constraint, right? We see that in the previous example, when you have permit key, right? So when I update those things, right? So there, the checking also happens at tuple level, right? So that is when, uh, I, mean, I mean, at least the default behavior. So that happened at tuple level, right? So that's why your orders start to matter. Because, yeah, maybe for different order, I'm going to have different violation. So here for check, the granularity is also at tuple level, okay? It's going to finish the tuple and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and do the whole thing. But that is something, I'm not sure whether you can check, uh, whether you can change this, but definitely for the primary key, you can change it to check uh, at uh, the whole query level, okay? So and that's something that I'm sure you can do. For check, I'm not sure whether you can change it, yeah. Okay, great. So another thing about check is especially important when you are uh, using a real database is surprisingly, it looks like a very important functionality, but not all databases actually uh, respect this constraint equally which is a very weird sentence to say if you think about it, but not, the database engine, not all database engine going to respect this equally. So when something weird happens about check, remember to Google it, okay? That's very important. It, 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 it depends on what database you are using. So let's look at one example. Um, let's hope we can open this up. Yes, okay. Now let's look at this. So I have this uh, schema where GPA plus semester equals to 10, okay? Uh, and then I insert this table, this value, 1155, and uh, I update students that GPA equals to GPA minus one. If I run this, who think we will throw an error? Why? <laughs> who think this will not throw an error? Okay, who have no idea? Because it's clearly a trick question. <laughs> okay, so if you run this, something interesting will happen. Uh, it's going to be fun, okay? If you not throw an error, and if you uh, select things from this relation, it's going to give you a tuple like this, 1145, which clearly violates the constraint that you cite that GPA plus semester equals to 10. So what happened? So, in, 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 okay, we, this will not be in the exam, okay? In exam, you better say this will throw an error, okay? Make sense? <laughs> <laughs> but this is important to know because the beauty about database, also the complexity about database is it's always linked to practice. We talk about all those beautiful theory, very clean, very elegant, but there's always, always the practical side. In practice, we'll see this, don't get surprised. So the fundamental reason behind it is up until 2004, MySQL actually doesn't respect check. It doesn't throw an error when you have a check constraint, simply ignore it um, for whatever reason that people decide to do. So there's actually a bug in MySQL. Uh, if you are doing MySQL 5.6, I believe, uh, there's actually, uh, they're going to ignore the check constraint essentially up to this day. So I don't know whether they fix it or not. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe they fix, I have no idea whether they fix or not, yeah. So, if, but essentially, if you are doing this 5.6, uh, this one is going to, uh, uh, like, like, like go, going to be fun. For example, if you do PostgreSQL 9.6, uh, then this one will throw an error for you, okay? So in practice, when you see this different behavior, okay, especially for integrity constraint, um, actually for many other SQL queries, 
but hopefully your drawing query will give you the same answer. Um, I hope, yeah, I, like, like you should expect that that going to give you the same answer. But especially when you talk about integrity constraint, talk about recursion, talk about uh, some other things. If you have a behavior that looks very weird, uh, do check, okay? It might not be your problem, it might be the database problem. Uh, and also because of different flavor of the database, going to implement different subset of the SQL standard. So one thing that I keep in mind is when we talk about SQL queries, all the type of things, so there's the standard about what should be there, and then there are different implementation of from different vendors, okay? It's very important to, to, to remember this two doesn't always match, okay? In many cases, it will be fun, but if there's a weird behavior coming from a database, yeah, do, um, you need to Google it, okay? Uh, Google MySQL check doesn't uh, throw an error or whatever, it's going to give you that, okay? So, but make sure you understand different databases are different. If there's one thing you remember from the course, different databases could be different. Um, and uh, whenever you have entire constraint, make sure that the database is doing the right thing, okay? So another thing is, in principle, the constraint that we, uh, I mean, and, and the, like in theory, okay? So the construction we provide, the check, could be more powerful, Right? So wouldn't that be nice if we are able to write a query like this, right? So what, like, can we write a sub-query uh, in the check, something like this? It's still top level, right? So nothing stops you, in theory. So whether you can write something like this? In most of the database systems, uh, if not all of the database systems, uh, you are not able to do this, okay? So for most of the database system, all you can do in check are those local tuple level condition that, involving, that cannot involve a subquery, okay? In theory, there's nothing stop you from doing that. But in practice, uh, at least in all databases that I know about, uh, you are not able to do that. Check could be powerful, but in practice, it's doing whatever we, we introduced so far. Okay? Any questions so far? Before we move on to another type of constraint. Okay. Okay, great. So now let's look at this. Okay, let's get back to what we want to do. We have this conceptual model, gave us a whole bunch of constraints. Now we introduce different ways to enforce those constraints when you're doing uh, logical, relational database design. Some of them can be enforced by primary key, that we know from Wednesday. And today we also know some of them can be enforced, for example, if you have the second constraint, what should you do? Yeah, you can, I can have the unique constraint when I define my schema. What about the first one? How should we deal with the first one? The first one is actually, if you look at this, it tells you, okay, for any tuple in R, that need to imply the following. That is, A, the first attribute in R, need to be of type, or entity, need to appear in that relation A, capital A. B, need to appear in capital B, right, C, need to appear in relation C. If you look at that concern, that looks weird. That looks like a different type of concern as what we have been talking about so far, because that involve multiple relations, right? So far, when we talk about all those concerns, unique, not now, right? Those like check, right? I mean, it's always involve a single relation. And check involve a single tuple in relation, right? How can we do this? How can we do the first constraint? How can we say, yeah, whatever you put in this relation, some value need to appear in the another relation. So that's give you something called a referential constraint, which actually is going to involve two different relations. So and uh, often, like in many cases, we call that foreign keys. And so sometimes people call that referential constraint. Sometimes people just say this is a foreign key, something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So essentially, it says that if an attribute of of a, of a relation is a foreign key, it means that this attribute is actually referring to a tuple from a different relation. And we are going to look at a like, lot of examples here. Assuming you have this lecture relation uh, with a professor's personnel number, remember that schema? 
that's a foreign key because that attribute actually refers to a tuple in the professor relation, right? In, in the natural design, right? You, you, you could have a world you say, yeah, I just don't want that, it's fine, right? But in a natural design, that personnel number attribute could be a foreign key because that refers to a professor. Yeah, so I think that's more process. Yeah, it's, it, it could be a foreign key. It doesn't have to, okay? So if, if you take that design, it, that means if you look at the personnel number attribute of the lecture relation, right, it can take a value <coughs> that only if that value appears in the personnel number attribute of the professor relation. It's a different relation. You cannot take any other value. So this is another example, okay? Like, okay, so, so I have one, one, one relation with students, you have ID there, and then you have another relation, for example, attendance. So the first attribute of the attendance relation is the student ID. And that's a foreign key referring to the ID of a student by saying that, essentially what I mean is whatever value you put into the student ID attribute of attendance need to appear in the student ID attribute of student table. Okay, so that's what we mean by foreign key. And this is a type of constraint that we want to introduce and understand. So definition of this is for every foreign key, one of the following two conditions must hold. Either the value is null, you're able to put, for example, in the attendance uh, student ID attribute, no, no value is fine. Or the refer tuple must exist, okay? One of these need to hold. So essentially, assuming you have this foreign key constraint, if you insert this tuple, what would the database give you? You put in the attend, student ID equals to one. It will not be okay. Why? Because I cannot find a student in this instance that ID equals to one. So the referred tuple does not exist, okay? So it's not going to be okay. What if you do this? You say I insert a new tuple where the ID is null. Yeah, this one's fine, okay? So one of these two conditions need to hold, okay? Yeah, it's either it's null or, it doesn't, uh, or the referred tuple must exist. And you can define that uh, in SQL by just doing this. So essentially, if you look at uh, the thing on the right-hand side, I first define a relation R, okay? So the first attribute RA is a primary key, RB is some whatever attribute. And when you define another relation S, the thing you can do is, say, okay, is you say, okay, there's a one attribute KA in S, that refers to the tuple in R, okay? You can say KA integer references R. In this case, it actually says the KA attribute of S refers to the primary key of R, okay? Essentially, SKA refers to RA in this case. And you can make that more specific. Okay, so you can define another, uh, another relation T, you have something like KB, okay? And the type is, uh, is a string, whatever, that refers to the B attribute of R, okay? You can make that precise. If you don't specify which attribute it, it refers to, it's going to refer to the primary key, but you can make that very precise. If you do this, right, so like uh, essentially, K the, the KB attribute of T refers to the B attribute of R, right? So we call SKA the foreign key, okay? Um, usually the referred attribute uh, need to be a primary key or at least have some unique constraint, um, but uh, in some databases it doesn't have to, okay? In a natural design of foreign key that you see in practice, in most of the cases, the referred attribute is either primary key or unique, or maybe have some index over that to make sure it's easier to check, uh, but uh, it doesn't have to. Okay. 
And again, similar to the check constraint, there's a whole bunch of implementation dependent caveat of different um, databases provided by different vendors, right? For example, if I talk about MySQL, uh, it kind of requires uh, the referred tuples to have some type of index, uh, like some type of index, right? To make sure it's kind of uh, easier to check. Uh, there's a whole bunch of assumptions that different databases can actually make on the foreign key constraint. But in this course, we talk about PostgreSQL. Uh, you don't need to care about this, this thing. But, but, but we are using a real database in practice. Yeah, PostgreSQL is a real database. But we are, when, when, when you are building real application using maybe other database systems like MySQL, or as Oracle's database, uh, SQL Server from Microsoft, or DB2 from IBM, right? So just make sure when you write referential uh, constraint, uh, check the manual to see the behavior, I, I mean, because that could surprise you, yeah. One interesting thing about foreign key is about the maintenance of that, because now I start to build this association between these two different relations. If I change one of that, how the other one would change, right? So now let's look at this example. I have students, I have lecture, I have a tense. And then I have two referential constraints. I have the student ID from a tense mapped to students. I have the lecture number from a tense mapped to lecture. So what if we delete one student? For example, we delete the first student, right? So what should we do? In this case, once you delete the tuple in a relation, you could break a referential constraint, right? Because there could be, uh, for all the lectures that student takes, if I delete one student from my student table, what should I do with the other tuples in the tense relation? So that's give you essentially different, could give you different behavior that you can specify inside your database about how the database can actually maintain that for you automatically. So again, right, if I delete the database course, right, from the lecture table, what should I do? with all the other tuples that are referring to the deleted tuple? What if I update some tuple in the student table, change the ID, right? So then what should I do with all the tuples referring to that tuple? So once you have these two relations, once you have this referential uh, association between them, right, you start to have the problem about how to update them, right? So in SQL standard, you can define different behavior here. So there's one mode called cascade, uh, which is actually going to propagate the update or delete. We are going to see what it means precisely. Okay? There's another mode called restrict. In this mode, what's going to do is, it's going to prevent the updates. Okay? So it's going to be very clear why I'm saying that in this way. It might sound weird, but it's going to prevent your updates before trying to do the change. I can give you an error, okay? So there's another thing called no action. In this case, it's going to prevent the modification after trying to change it, okay? So like, uh, like uh, it, this one could be, will become very clear what I mean, okay? So, and then there's another mode called uh, set default or set null, right? Which is actually set references to null or to a default value. So these are four different modes. So what would happen in the cascade mode, right? So in this case, right, so assuming I have the tens mapped to students, and I say, okay, let's delete one student from the table. In this case, what should I do? So you are going to cascade these updates, okay, to the table. You are going to, if I delete the student, right, you are going to delete that, okay, uh, in the, in the, in the attendance table. If I update, the ID of the students, you are also going to update the ID in the tense table. It's going to cascade all the changes, either deletion or modification, okay? This is why it's very natural, right? So restrict, the another mode you can specify. Uh, what it does is, before I make any changes, I try to reason whether it's going to violate it or not. If it's going to violate, I throw an error, okay? So in this case, Assuming I want to delete the same students, what the database will give you is simply say, okay, you cannot delete that. 
Because once you delete that, uh, there will be tuples that relies on it going to violate the foreign key constraint, right? In this case, the database is going to store an error for you, okay? So another mode is no action. In this case, what database try to do, I mean, it's, it's actually try to make some action, but the mode is called no action, okay? So here, when you try to delete something, right, what database try to do is, is actually try to make the changes, and then it try to check. In this case, again, it's going to throw an error because once you delete that students, there will be tuples in your, in your tense relation that relies on this tuple, right, and it's going to uh, validate the constraint. The difference between restrict and, and no action, that's in the next slides, okay? So I know that uh, at this moment, one question is what's the difference between restrict and no action, but, uh, but uh, just, yeah, give me another couple minutes. Yeah, it's going to become clear. So force mode uh, is set default, set null, right? So in this case, right, so if you just delete the students, what you are going to do is to say, okay, now I have examples in a tense relation that violate this foreign key constraint. What should I do? I just set the value to null, okay? And to make sure it's fine at the end. So this is a four different mode. And you can specify that we will define the schema in this way, okay? You can say, yeah, so now I define this referential constraint Personnel number in the lecture table need to refer to a, a professor. If you don't, don't specify the attribute of the professor, it's going to go to the primary key. And then you say on delete. Whenever you delete something right, in the professor table, I want to pick one of this mode. Whenever you are update in the professor table, I want to uh, pick one of this mode to maintain this referential constraint. Okay? That's something you can do. Now there's one question open, uh, which is what's the difference between restrict and no action? Uh, this one is actually pretty tricky, uh, and if you see the behavior of many database systems, uh, they're probably no different at all. Uh, but in principle, there are differences here, okay? So in principle, now we talk about principles, Restrict is going to throw an error immediately that it realizes you are going to violate the constraint. The action is it will try to implement your modifications and then check and then throw an error. Okay? So in principle, that is what these two things are trying to do. But in practice, right, so it's become a little bit trickier. Now let's look at one example. Okay, so this one is like, I think if you use SQLite, like, uh, if you try SQLite four years ago, I'm sure <laughs> you can reproduce this behavior. I'm not sure today. Um, now let's look at this, okay? So there are two programs side by side. I have a table B, and I have table A, and I have foreign key from the A to B. And the only difference uh, is on update, one is restrict, another is no action. And I will insert two tuples. I insert one in B, I insert one in A. So I'm fine, okay? And then I try to say, okay, so I start a transaction. So we are going to talk about transaction after Easter. Uh, you can think about them as a group of uh, statements you can make to the database system. Uh, for the first transaction, on the left-hand side is, oh, I update B, set B equals to B plus one, and then I set A equals to A, A equals A plus one, okay? I, I increase these two things. On the right-hand side, right, I do the same thing, okay? So what would be the behavior here? The behavior, the first one is restrict, right? So it's going to throw an error immediately the moment it realizes, okay, I mean, it's going to violate it. In this case, it's going to throw an error in the middle. It's going to say, yeah, your first query, I don't care what error you are going to do next, but your first query that you issued violate the constraint. Once I do this, I will not have the tuple in A, uh, so, so, so there's, there will be tuple in A that uh, uh, does not have refer tuple anymore, so I'm going to throw an error in the middle. If you do no action, in this case, it's going to try to implement your, 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 your updates and then check. In this case, it's actually going to finish 
it's going to implement the, 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 the updates that you have on B, implement the updates on A, and then say, yeah, it's actually fun, right? Both ID increase by one, right? So in this case, uh, it's going to be okay. So again, I mean, this is not the behavior that you, that you can reproduce in all the database systems, okay? So at least for this very specific version of SQLite, uh, this example actually shows the difference between these two. Okay, make sense? This is very tricky, okay? Okay, now let's go back to this database instance we have been working on in the last couple of weeks now, right? So I try to think about, okay, how can we define the schema? What type of constraints do we have? Right? So this is our old uh, university schema that we have been looking at for a couple of weeks. We will do the students. We have the ID, right? Integer, primary key, right? I think that's very natural. You have the name, which is a string. Uh, we don't want student with empty name, right? I think that makes sense, right? So you can have this not null constraint to say, yeah, whatever value you put in here, the name of the student cannot be null. You have semester, which is integer, right? And uh, for example, check semester need to be between one and 13, for example, right? So this is actually one collection of constraints that you could have that actually make a lot of sense for the student relation in this database, okay? And then you can define similarly for professor, right? So prof uh, personnel number of the professor is an integer, primary key, makes sense, right? The name, not null, right? Uh, you can say here's a level, right, of a professor. Uh, it's a kind of two characters, right, specified by the level of professor. And I have a check condition that you cannot put any two char character things into that attribute. Whatever you put in need to be one of these three, for example, right? Uh, and then uh, you have say, yeah, each professor have an office, it's room. The room number is an integer, uh, it's unique, right? So you have unique constraint. And this all makes sense. Right? So, so, so one thing we are expecting is you are able to take one of the schema and read about it and try to understand all the constraints that we have there in the exam, okay? So, and for the lecture thing, right? So I think, I think it makes sense, right? How lecture number, integer, primary key, you have the title of the lecture, you have the credit point of the lecture, uh, and then you have this personnel number attribute of the lecture table, which professor is teaching this, uh, and we hope whatever value you put there need to refer to a real professor, right? So you, you, if you hope to have that, right, you have personal number, integer, references, professor, okay? So that's a foreign key constraint. And you can also define uh, the behavior of maintenance, right? You can say on delete, set null. If I delete the professor, uh, then, I, then I do not want you to delete uh, this lecture because hopefully someone else will teach that, right? So in this case, I will set the, the, the personal number of the lecture table to null. Right? You can see these two different behavior, right? In different applications, different mode of maintenance makes sense, right? If you delete the professor, right? So you can say, yeah, now there's no professor teaching this, let me delete the whole lecture, like a uh, whole course, right? Or you can say, yeah, the lecture will stay here, even though there's no one teaching it, I will set that to null. Right? So that is one example that this different mode of maintenance actually could make a difference, okay? So which one is correct? I mean, we have no idea, but uh, it depends on your, on, on your application. Whatever makes sense for application is a good one, okay? But in this case, right, if I delete the professor, I'm gonna set the corresponding lecture to null. And we can read this together, right? You have this uh, tense relation with student ID and uh, the lecture number, student ID, right? Refer, uh, re reference students, right? And uh, on delete, you uh, cascade, for example. And then you have this uh, lecture number uh, uh, re refers to lecture. If you delete the lecture, you are going to cascade. You are also going to delete the corresponding uh, attendance kind of uh, record. Uh, and then you say, yeah, the primary key of this relation or tense, right, uh, is going to be the combination. The combination to be unique. A student cannot take a lecture twice, at least in this example, if you set it in this way. Um, but one student could, multi could take multiple lectures, and one lecture could have multiple students taking it. 
right? So this is what you are seeing by seeing primary key is the combination, okay? So and you can say, yeah, so there's the uh, prerequisite relation between lectures, right? Before taking some lecture, you take the other. You can say, yeah, the prerequisite attributes need to be a lecture, so it refers to uh, the lecture relation, and then you have the follow-up lecture, which refers to the lecture relation too. They are both lectures, and this, this makes sure that happen. Whenever you delete something in the lecture relation, you cascade, okay? And the primary key here, right? So you are saying, yeah, uh, uh, there's a many-to-many -many relationship, right? So, so, so the primary key is actually the combination of these two attributes. So and you can do more, right? For example, you have tests, right? St uh, students take tests uh, offered by a professor and get a grade, right? So in this case, you can have the student ID, the lecture number, the personnel number, all have foreign key, right? The into refers to real students, real lecture, real professor that actually exist. Uh, the grade need to be uh, a numerical value. So there's a condition in to be between one and six, for example, right? So if I put a seven there, right, it goes to throw an error for me. Uh, and the primary key here, right, is the student ID and the lecture ID, okay? So that's it need to be unique, okay? So, I mean, that's what, I mean, you specify this, that's what that says, right? If you're in your application, you have a different type uh, of constraints, you can adjust that accordingly. So this, just one example. This is actually finished up the modeling process. Actually, not yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so I wanted to say that for, that, that that finish up the modeling process of this application, uh, but not yet. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we have more to talk about next week. Yeah. So, 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 but this one tells you the schema, the type of the attributes, and the constraint. Okay. Whatever cardinality constraint you have inside your database um, is get, getting reflected. Whatever referential constraint you have in your database, uh, it gets reflected, okay? When you define a real application, there's another step left, uh, which you actually reason about when and the whether we should merge the table. That's the next one step, okay? So we haven't done about modeling yet, okay? But we can do a lot of things now. So now we know how to do this. Let's try to think about one question. That is, there's still one thing that we know how to do in entity relationship diagram in the conceptual modeling, but we haven't talked about it yet. That is, we know how to define a one-to-many or many-to-one relationship now. Uh, we can enforce that by this uniqueness constraint, right? So what can we do if we say there is the kind of one-to-one -one relationship between two entity sites, right? So how can we encode this? So let's look at one example, okay? So we have two entity sites. One is employee, another is office, okay? We want to say one employee can have at most one office, and the one office can be assigned to at most one employee. There's this one-to-one -one relationship between these two things. So how can we enforce that when we design our schema? So this is the only thing left that we don't know what to do. Uh, like in SQL, but we know how to do an entity relationship diagram. Can we do this? Let's look at this example. Why this has, I, 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 I already write it down, they have problems, so. What's the problem here? Does this one actually enforce one-to-one -one relationship between these two entity sites? I have an office relation I say, yeah, there's a professor ID in this office relation refers to employee, and I have employee relation have a room refers to office. So this one will not enforce this one-to-one -one relationship. Okay, I think, I, 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 I hope it's easier to see, right? So like one counter example is you have two offices and you have two employee, right? So it is okay for you to have, okay, office one and employee one is connected, great. And then you have uh, employee one also assigned to a different office. Because when never have foreign key, you don't check their consistency. In the office table, you could say, yeah, this office belongs to this employee. Uh, in the employee table, you can say, yeah, this employee have this office. 
but they, they could be a different one. There's nothing in the referential constraint saying that it need to uh, be, be the same, okay? You have office one, have employee one, but in the employee table, employee one associated with office two, right? So in this case, and in the, in the office relation, have employee, uh, office two, have employee two, so type of sense, right? When you have this, you are actually not enforcing one-to-one -one relationships by doing this referential constraint thing, okay? So what can we do? How can we enforce a uh, one-to-one -one relationship? Well, there are multiple ways to do it. Uh, just let's show you one example about how to enforce that. So one way to do it is you could have an employee relation with employee. Uh, you could have an office relation with office. And then you have another relation called has office. Okay? Contains the employee ID and it contains the, uh, the room ID. Okay? So they actually uh, refers to, uh, the employee ID refers to employee, the room refers to an office. And then you'll say, okay, now I have other constraints. My employee ID is unique, meaning that one employee can only appear once in this relation. And also, my room is also unique. It's not the combination is unique, okay? When the combination is unique, you are not doing one-to-one. -one. You say, I have two unique constraints. One is on the employee ID, another is on the room. One employee only appear once, one room only appear once, so this gave, and, and, and they cannot be null, okay? It must be associated to something. So this gave you this one-to-one -one correspondence between these two different entities. Okay, so there could be different ways for to enforce different type of one-to-one -one relationship, right? So, but this gives you one way to do that. Okay, if you do this, right, there could be employee without office. There are those employees that exist in the employee table, but doesn't show up in the in the has office table. It's fun. Okay, you can have uh, office that is empty. Fun. Okay. Uh, what you cannot have is to have one employee associated with two offices, because then that employee will appear twice in the has office relation. You cannot have one office being assigned to two employees, because in that case, the, the, the office will going to appear twice in the has office relation. So what if we want to say all employees must have an office? In addition to this one-to-one -one mapping, I also want to make sure all employees must have an office. How can we do that? So one way to do it is you can have another referential constraint from employee to has office. So say whatever I appear here, need, uh, whatever employee I appear in this employee relation also need to appear in the has office relation. Okay? In theory, that's something you could do. Okay? Okay, great. So that's all about uh, constraints that you can enforce inside the database system. Uh, next week on Wednesday, we are going to talk about theory. We are going to talk about, talk about functional dependency, which is something that you are going to use to reason about whether you can actually merge two relations together or not, and what would be the consequence, and what would be the trade-off. Yeah, so that's all for today. I'll see you guys next week.